You might think that large-scale environmental restoration projects in the United States must come from scientists or experienced engineers. But today's story is different. The project that changed the future of New York Harbor actually started with a few high school students. Now recognized as the most impactful environmental education project in America, they still release millions of oysters into the sea every year. No advanced technology, no huge budget, and not a money-making venture. So why did these students succeed where many professional teams failed? And could this model spread around the world? Let's start now. Even before the United States was founded, before New York was a Dutch colony, the waters around Manhattan were a true oyster empire. And that's not an exaggeration. Over 220,000 acres of oyster reefs, larger than the entire city of San Francisco today, covered the area. They're so thick that 17th century Dutch ships had to divert their course, only a few feet off course and run aground on the reef, not the rocks. But oysters had been around much longer than that. Archaeologists at New York Harbor found ancient trash piles that were actually layers of oyster shells stacked on top of each other, dating back to 6950 BC. When Europeans arrived, this ecosystem exploded into a huge industry. In the 18th century, the Dutch in New Amsterdam named Pearl Street because the road was covered with oyster shells. Ellis Island and Liberty Island were once called Little Oyster Island and Great Oyster Island. By the 19th century, New York had the world's largest system of oyster bars. Oysters became the democratic food. Rich and poor alike ate the same oysters, only the beer glass was different. Authors Annie Hawk Lawson and Jonathan Deutsch wrote, Even the poorest New Yorkers could fill up on oysters and bread. Oyster barges docked every day in the 1850s. Workers shucked them right on the docks and served them fresh. So what did New Yorkers do with the millions of shells after eating the oysters? Millions of tons of shells were used to fill land, build roads, and mix into mortar for construction. Trinity Church, for example, was built using oyster shell powder. Ecologically, oyster reefs are perfect water filters. One oyster can filter three to five gallons a day. They filtered billions of gallons daily, reduced waves, calmed storms, and created habitats for hundreds of species. A perfect ecosystem. For centuries, New York thrived on oysters. By the late 1800s, demand soared, and fishing boats scraped the entire sea floor, collecting one million oysters every week. And even though there was a ban on harvesting oysters during spawning season since 1715, human greed knew no bounds. At such high harvesting rates, what do you think happened? That's right, they were wiped out. Massive dredges scraped the bottom, taking everything, mud, seaweed, coral, and unrelated species, but there were fewer and fewer oysters. But the real killer wasn't the fishermen. It was human sewage. Yes, you heard that right. Even with overfishing, some oysters could have survived, but sewage killed off all the baby oysters. New York's combined sewer overflow system works in a simple but dangerous way. Whenever there's heavy rain, sewage, toilet water, kitchen grease, laundry water, industrial chemicals, all flow straight into the Hudson River and New York Harbor, untreated. In the 19th and 20th centuries, chemical plants used the river mouth as a giant trash can, dumping heavy metals and toxins directly into the water. Oxygen levels plummeted. The bottom turned into a dead zone. Fish floated up dead. Oysters, which can't move, were wiped out. Nature didn't go easy either. Storms swept away the last remaining reefs. By 1927, the last oyster bed was closed. The government issued a chilling warning. Do not eat New York oysters, you could die. At this point, many believed New York Harbor was dead forever. But America doesn't just stand by. In 1972, though late, Congress passed the Clean Water Act, a law called a magic revival spell for America's rivers and estuaries. From that moment, dumping untreated sewage into rivers became a federal crime. What had been done freely for hundreds of years, human waste, chemicals, heavy metals, grease from millions of households, was now strictly forbidden. New York had to act. The city poured over $45 billion into its wastewater system, enough to build nearly 25 Empire State buildings. They built new treatment plants, upgraded pipes, and installed pollution monitoring equipment. 
this became one of the most expensive environmental programs in U.S. history. Compared to Asian or South American cities at the time, which still dumped waste directly into the sea, New York was like a seriously ill patient willing to take medicine. But this medicine was expensive and results didn't come overnight. After a few years, water in some areas changed from brown to light blue. Fish began returning to river stretches thought to be lifeless. The biggest surprise. Biologists discovered a few tiny wild oysters clinging to rotting wooden pilings under the docks, just a few in small clusters. But to experts, it was like seeing a sapling grow in the desert. It was the first sign that what seemed impossible, restoring New York, might actually happen. But to bring oysters back faster, human help was needed. And the person with that idea wasn't a professor, scientist, or climate expert. It was a high school student. In 2014, at New York Harbor School, a group of students stood amid a mountain of oyster shells. They mound seep wows, trash from dozens of Manhattan restaurants delivered each day. Their mission sounded like a joke, but it changed the city's future. Turn trash into living reefs. Founders Pete Malinowski and Murray Fisher believed in something most experts thought impossible, that a few students, a few buckets, and a few hundred pounds of shells could change the ecology of a city of 8 million. Sounds crazy, right? But that craziness became the driving force behind the Billion Oyster Project. These kids weren't just building science models in class, they waded through mud, picked up trash, dove into 32 to 41 degrees Fahrenheit water, checked every oyster cage, and recorded details down to the millimeter. While other schools debated, should students use cell phones? These students were seeding oyster larvae to save a real ecosystem. They collected shells from over 70 restaurants, cured them for months in open shell yards, and turned the first 100,000 pounds of shell trash into new homes for baby oysters. In makeshift labs, students raised oyster larvae, tracked their growth, tagged each batch, then hung cages in the harbor and monitored them for thousands of hours. By 2024, over 130 million oysters have been seeded, and every year they release millions more, aiming for 1 billion oysters by 2035. But more importantly, this isn't just an ecological project, it's an educational model the world should learn from. Many countries in Europe and Asia have sent experts to New York to observe. Because if students can restore a dead harbor, the question is clear. If New York can do it, why not Sydney, London, or Tokyo? You'd think everyone would support ecosystem restoration, right? Not so. As the project spread, New Jersey suddenly banned oyster restoration in polluted waters. New York didn't ban it, but the hurdles were endless. To release one batch of oysters, the group had to get permits as complicated as opening a new factory. All restoration areas are permanently off-limits for harvesting. The city even required 24-7 surveillance cameras and RFID chips on every oyster cage to prevent theft. And what about officials? Many dismissed the students' efforts as just a school science fair project not worth the city's attention. Still, the team quietly set up conveyor belts to move shells, secretly seeded reefs in forgotten corners of the shoreline. By the end of 2015, the unbelievable happened. Millions of oysters grew along piers, breakwaters, bays, and narrow channels. The entire New York Harbor was being rebuilt from the bottom up, not by the government, not by corporations, but by high school students and volunteers. From 2016 to 2020, a turning point came. Even veteran ecologists could hardly believe it. An ecosystem once called completely dead began to come back to life. It started at Hudson River Park, where the project team deployed thousands of reef balls, hole-filled concrete mounds that look like underwater Mars, and gabion baskets packed with oyster shells. Imagine building an apartment complex for sea life right in the middle of what was once America's most polluted river. After just three years, results exceeded all expectations. 35 million baby oysters appeared, the gabion baskets attracted 37 species, and the reef balls created space for 32 more. An area once a biological desert turned into an underwater neighborhood, bustling and vibrant, reborn from nothing. 
This recovery was even faster than giant land reclamation projects like Singapore's Marina Bay or Dubai's Palm Island. But the key difference? Here, nature rebuilt itself. The biggest surprise happened at Tappan Zee. Here, the team didn't seed larvae, incubate spat, or raise any oysters. They just laid down a layer of bare rocks as a what-if experiment. The results stunned everyone. 5.8 million wild oysters came on their own, rooted themselves, and formed new reefs. No technology, no human hand, just a healthy enough environment, and nature returned instantly. By 2024, New York Harbor saw a revival even environmental experts called unbelievable. After 10 years of persistence, the city restored over 130 million live oysters, spanning 19 acres of reefs, about 14 soccer fields, right in one of the world's most crowded cities. From restaurant waste, they recycled 900 tons of oyster shells, turning them into the foundation for artificial reefs stretching across the Hudson and nearby bays. This had an almost immediate ecological impact. The 130 million oysters help filter billions of gallons of water daily, the equivalent of cleaning the water in 1,000 Olympic-sized swimming pools naturally. The water got clearer, fish and crabs returned, and over 35 native species reappeared in places once filled only with trash and black mud. The reefs also act as natural breakwaters, reducing storm impact and helping restore coastal marshes. But there's a paradox. New Yorkers can never eat these oysters. After every heavy rain, the combined sewer overflow system still dumps untreated sewage into the river, making oyster harvesting dangerous. Even as New York comes back to life from the bottom up, the oyster project isn't immune to risks. In fact, these young reefs are still fragile. Everything could collapse in just a few months. The biggest threat is disease. Two classic diseases, Dermo and MSX, can wipe out an entire reef in a single summer. Imagine. 10 years of seeding, hundreds of thousands of hours of work, and just a few degrees increase in water temperature could erase it all. These diseases once killed 90% of Chesapeake Bay's oysters, causing America's biggest ecological shock in the 1980s. The second enemy, climate change. Sudden heat waves can cause mass die-offs, like the coral bleaching you've seen at the Great Barrier Reef. Plus, when extreme rain hits, fresh water floods the harbor, dropping salinity so fast that oysters die from salt shock before you know it. In 2021, one heavy rain killed thousands in just 48 hours. And don't forget, pollution isn't gone. New York's combined sewer overflow system still works just as it did for hundreds of years. Every heavy rain sends sewage, waste, grease, and chemicals straight into the river. That's why, even with millions of oysters living under the city, New Yorkers can never eat them. Despite disease, climate, pollution, and technical limits, this project is spreading worldwide. In Australia, Sydney is restoring oyster reefs to protect coastlines from big waves. In Europe, the United Kingdom is rebuilding native oyster reefs after losing 95%. Even Japan is experimenting with recycled shells to clean up Hiroshima Bay. The story of New York's oysters isn't just about a shellfish. It's a reminder that even when humans destroy an ecosystem over centuries, there's still a chance to start over, if we want to and if we act. A few students, a few buckets of shells, and a crazy belief revived a sea that seemed forever lost. So what do you think? Could this project become a global model? Or is it a one-of-a-kind New York miracle? Leave your thoughts below. I'd love to hear your perspective. And if you enjoy strange but hopeful environmental stories like this, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss the next journey.